Oh, y'all got quiet. All right, it's time for the storm. I'm just thinking snow days. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. You know I'm going to record a lecture. That was cool. weird, weird times. Um, all right. So next week, when I see you here, to be an exam for you, right? I think uh, I have practice questions. Uh, I'll make them available this morning, if not. Endocrine chapter, blood chapter. You, know, you guys, do what you have to do. Uh, hopefully, you saw my blood lecture online, my endocrine lecture online. You've been in class. So, you had the lectures, you learned smarts. You, uh, lab is going to help. Half of you is uh, fool around with some blood and just doing stuff, you know, working with it. it helps you learn a bunch better than just reading it or listening to you. So, yeah, you've got what you need. And of course, you have another week to study. And the questions will be things I've talked about, things on my lectures. Yeah. Well, all of you, almost all of you know that. So I want you to do well. Two chapters. Hormones. Know them. Know the glands, types of blood cells, all the miscellaneous, the few diseases I've talked about. Just study that. Be prepared. You do well. All right. And then next, after this, we talk about the heart during the cardiovascular system. So after the blood is pumping this magical, beautiful fluid through your body, the five liters of it being pumped, the pressure of your heart muscle is pumping it around. Now in the immune system, we'll talk about how, you know, COVID and such, and uh, how uh, these the blood cells here, some of them have memories for the little spike proteins and um, vaccinated people. Very quickly notice those and then wipe it out. Yeah, so that's a whole long story I'll talk about. All right, so blood, on uh, the first lecture, I thought a lot, I had a lecture I had recorded. Uh, I'm so curious. I was always just wondering how many of you like watch the YouTube versus the Zoom. So just raise your hand if you watch the YouTube version and then the Zoom. It's not half and half. It's so weird. Yeah, maybe a little more. Okay. Uh, the Zoom gives you like it's a transcript. You can't understand what I'm saying. I guess that's a little better, but YouTube I think is more convenient. But anyway, so you use both. I'll keep doing it just like that. Whatever you. All right. So what? Indeed. Um, the last lecture I talked about red blood cells. You guys know the size, they're about seven and a half microns. You know that uh, the shape, they don't have a nucleus, so they can't repair themselves. But they last about 120 days, about uh, four months, they, they force around. And then when they get, uh, they lose that shine of that new red blood cell, they, uh, they are noticed by these macrophages that are, it's an old red blood cell, it can't like squeeze, it's not flexible, it'll be destroyed. The macrophage will eat it up and you recycle the iron. But remember, you some of that heme uh, the, turns into Billy Bearden, Billy Rubin, which are these greenish, orange pigments. And that goes in your bile. When you get jaundice and it builds up, see you're breaking down too many blood cells, you'd be jaundiced. You'd be the whites of your eyes would be kind of yellow, your skin might be yellow. Kind of the newborns. Let's talk about that. And then, of course, to make new red blood cells, you need iron, you need folic acid and vitamin B12. To make these things all made in your bone marrow from uh, parasites or pluripotent. It can become a lot of them, not everything, but it can become any kind of blood cell, stem cells. And the, what's the hormone that makes you make more red blood cells? EPO, erythropoietin. And that makes you make more red blood cells. You make millions every minute uh, because you got to replace all these. Again, yeah, so much that was the last lecture. And I ended up last lecture talking about white blood cells. I introduced it and I talked about neutrophils. So there's five kinds that we looked at in lab. We're going to look at this week in lab, five kinds to identify them. So I'll talk about them in the lecture now. And then my last recorded lecture, I have on the schedule review of endocrine and, uh, and blood. So I'll make a, I'll make a more lecture. So you guys, I'll have presented all the information really after you guys hear me today, but I'll put one more recorded lecture if you want to help you review these things. So I'll make it as your third topic. That's what's left. All right, so um, the white blood cells, the neutrophils are um, the most common. And this shows the relative abundance into these high types. You can see neutrophils, hell, it's like 60, 70% of them. And neutrophils are dumb. They're like the cavalry that's sent to an infection. They will eat any bad guys, anything foreign. They can only eat a couple dozen, and then they blow up and turn to pus, you know. But they just like, oh, these are I'll eat it. And they'll blow up. 
Um, they go to any kind of like infection, or splinter, uh, things like that. Beautiful. And then um, to remember this, some people remember naughty little monkeys eat bananas. So bananas is the rarest. Naughty is the most common. Yeah. And then in person, in the practical, I'll have you guys identify. If you look up top, you see monocytes are the biggest. And then these three have granules in them. And then the little ones are lymphocytes. So these all may be foreign terms. And once you guys study it, you'll be able to recognize these. You know what they do. Really. All right, when you look at these things, the red blood cell here, the erythrocyte, is just there for scale. So you can see you have three granulocytes. They got granules in them when you stain them with our typical stain. The other two agranulocytes mean without granule cells. And so that's the monocyte and lymphocyte. They're kind of, the cytoplasm is clear. It's not all granular. Yeah, cool. They're in a size scale. You can see monocytes are two to three times the size. Or the other is maybe twice the size. All right, here's the five. Neutrophil means neutral loving. Basophil means basic loving. It's bright blue, purple. And eosinophil means acid loving. So they kind of bright red. I hope you memorize it. Basophil, basic loving blue. Eosinophil, acid red. Neutrophil, neutral. Normal color. The monocytes are big ones, and lymphocytes are huge T cells. All right, so neutrophils. If you're going to guess on the practical, guess neutrophil. <laughs> it's 60%, you know, it's the most common one. Um, it has this lobe nucleus, usually two to five little lobes, and it's got some granules in it. And you all know white blood cells, they got a nucleus. Red blood cells don't have a nucleus, so they stay purple. They really jump out at you in a sea of red blood cells. Oh, let's talk so, um, These are the same size, the same nucleus of the neutrophil, and they're filled with granules that stain bright red in our skin. And when I think about these, they are good. They're good for um, parasites like worms and uh, and allergies. And uh, they can they can be phagocytic. They can't eat the bad guys. But mostly they're filled with these chemicals. And so that you guys have a stuffy nose allergic reaction. These guys dump out these chemicals that will help destroy that parasite. Yeah, so if you guys had allergies and it took your blood, you might have elevated acidophils. Definitely like any kind of parasitic infection. But they're pretty rare. We're talking about like 3%, 5%. Another view, they just stain, the granules are just bright. And these granules are filled with chemicals. Yes, they fight allergy enemies. We have a couple of pictures, more of them. So you see, if you see one, it's going to have bright red granules. It's a neutrophil. For, so it has the same kind of nucleus, but neutrophil don't have a bright red granule. Here's these cynophilic disorders. You can see we have too many of them. You're going to have uh, always have this inflammation and this uh, overreaction, right? It's allergic kind of reaction. So, um, cynophilic disorders are a blood disorder where you just have too many of these and you're kind of overreacting. You always uh, have this kind of allergic foot. All right, the so rarest of the rare. Basophils are less than half a percent, right? So, you'd have to look at hundreds before you, if you, in case you found one of these. But, Bright blue, purple, black. These guys are filled with two chemicals I want you to know. And I've talked about, I'll talk about again, talk about before. Um, I talked about heparin already. Heparin is a blood thinner. That's what uh, coats the tubes you keep blood in or the carbs of blood typing. Heparin, uh, along with other blood thinners, you know, is going to keep blood from clotting. And then histamine, we've all heard of antihistamines if you have a stuff that goes. Histamine causes blood vessels to dilate and become leaky. So famously, if your nose is stuffy, an antihistamine will keep those blood vessels in your nasal passages from being so leaky and the tissues won't swell as much to be able to breathe better. But in this case, why are you in a particular, uh, uh, get a cut or some kind of infection? Why would you want to release histamine and heparin? Well, it's going to cause blood to flow faster 
like it's gonna cause it to, heparin's gonna make it thinner, and then the histamine's gonna make it leaky so that if I had a cut on my finger, it would get swollen and hot and red. That's because the, the histamine and heparin are causing a lot of blood flow in the area, because that will bring the neutrophils and all the blood infection fighting cells there. So basophils exist in all your tissues, and when there's damage or injury or invasion, they will release their chemicals, histamine and heparin, and it'll cause blood flow and leaky capillaries to help bring the cavalry to help. Yeah, all right. Look at this. Look how dark it's getting. Almost obscuring the pictures. Yep, there's some basic bills. Still rare, but look at those blue, blue veins. All right, last two. We'll talk about monocytes. Monocytes turn into macrophages, and we'll talk about lymphocytes, which are your B cells and T cells. All right, so lymphocytes are your B and T cells, you heard them. We hear about an HIV, the helper T cells get infected, things like that. So B cells and T cells are for your immune response, your specific immune. We're going to get to this chapter, but neutrophils are not specific. They eat any bad guys. These lymphocytes, these B cells, you have memory cells right now in your lymph nodes that remember, well, last time you get sick, uh, your old cold, that or the new cold would be a new, new version of it, but for me, chicken pox is a kill. It's going to remember I had that. And uh, yeah, and it's going to fight again. Or the COVID vaccine. Some of these going to have memory cells for that spike protein. And if you get exposed to it, they're going to wake up and make antibodies like, wash over your body and take care of it quickly. So the lymphocytes, B cells, and T cells are for your immune response. And it's specific. So there's, that's the second most common. Naughty little monkeys, lymphocytes, second most common. So you see a lot of these. And you look at it, it's, it's bigger than a red blood cell, and it's got a huge nucleus. This nucleus fills it up. And uh, again, some of these, the B cells make antibodies. Y'all, I'll talk about that a lot too. The antibodies. Um, and there's memory ones, again, that, that remember your vaccines, remember your illnesses, you know, for these guys can last decades. Um, now, one other thing, when it's in the blood, these lymphocytes are going somewhere. Actually, all these white blood cells, I mean, you guys do a smear and you look at your own blood, those things are just traveling in your blood. And they're going to leave the bloodstream and go, especially these guys go in your lymph nodes. And uh, they will sit there, lymph nodes in your groin, your armpit, right? You got lymph nodes everywhere. They're going to be filtering your body's fluids and they're going to be looking for invasions. So I just want you to know, we take a blood sample when we look at them, they're just Taking them, that's like they're on the highway. They have to get off somewhere. They get off somewhere and they'll do their job in your body's tissues. And those neutrophils, they last like 12 hours. They last less than a day. So the ones you see in your blood smear, they're going to be dead <laughs> right tomorrow. They're, they're on their way somewhere in case you need them. Yep, we're looking at it. Huge nucleus. Yeah, there's a good picture in the middle. So you can see it's not that big. I mean, it's bigger than a nucleus. Your lymphocytes. And if you guys have, uh, you're fighting an infection, you'll have a lot of these because uh, they're the ones that make the antibodies. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to it. The natural killer. Yeah, these things are just uh, awesome. Yeah, one of these guys, they can spew out millions of antibodies like every minute. And these things will float in your blood, and then some foreign invader, they'll just dom it up. So here's some in a lymph node. Yeah, you recognize them? Big, huge purple nucleus. So when I look at this up here, this could be a tonsil, an appendix, a lymph node. It's going to be bright purple because those big nuclei. There's tons of, of lymphocytes. And they're just monitoring the environment. If there's any bad guys, these guys will, uh, um, bad guys, anything foreign is called an antigen. An antigen is going to cause a reaction in your body. So anything that's foreign material, it's going to wash over these guys. And when it hits one that's like, like fits that foreign material, it will wake up and it will clone itself and make antibodies. So that's the deal. We'll get to that in more All right, so that's your lymphocytes. You know, wicked important. Uh, there's a whole big story behind it.
All right, lastly, these monocytes. So monocytes are huge. Usually the nucleus is indented. It can be lobed. And as I say in class, I mean, we're not experts. Like a small monocyte might look like a big neutrophil. So, you know, keep that in mind. But this is obviously a monocyte. Now, the key is, in the blood, it's called a monocyte. When it leaves the blood and it goes into your tissues, it's going to turn into a macrophage. Macrophage means big eater. And macrophages are found throughout your body. They, they, they cruise your lungs looking for bad things. They cruise your liver. They cruise in your spleen. They're all over the place. And they will engulf bad guys like neutrophils did. These guys are big and they can eat hundreds of bad guys. Yeah, you see they last longer. Neutrophil lasts about 12 hours. These can last months. And they're just, they have the ability to eat even like, um, like everything, like big, like debris and stuff. Neutrophils are too small to like uh, add something really big. So these macrophages have different names, different parts of your, your body. They're everywhere. So as we go on the rest of AMP, talk about the lungs, I'll show you guys macrophages that are cruising along looking for, for uh, bacteria, looking for uh, smoke uh, residue, you know, anything that they can eat that's bad. Big macrophage. And they're the ones that recycle red blood cells. If, if it's going bad, they'll eat it and digest it and you can recycle the parts. So they're like neutrophils, but they are more longer lasting. And they can eat hundreds instead of just dozens. Sure yeah, here's one each not eat. He's a column or whatever that is. Yeah, so imagine you're this, you know, this foreign bacteria you want to eat, right? You can see this thing will will recognize it's foreign, it will engulf it, and then lysosomes will, will attach to it and, and give you kind of acid and digestion enzymes to break it apart to recycle it. So that's what they're doing. If you're a bad guy, it's your worst nightmare. <laughs> this big, you know, roaming thing that's just eating all your friends, you know, just throwing them, but good for you. And the immune system will see they actually eat bad guys and these bacteria, and they will take pieces of them and they will present them on their surfaces. Say, dude, I found this weird bacteria for those lymphocytes. And you guys remember the term apoptosis? Is when it's programmed cell death, like the, the cell commits suicide. It's going to say, I don't want to die. And then it's going to, it's going to, these guys will clean up the debris. Oh, I thought it was a cool picture. They, they put these little plastic pieces and, and they can see here's some cells in your, uh, in your lungs and you eat these blue plastic. You can see they fill them up. So they're going to eat anything that's formed. Right? All right. So neutrophils, you see, kind of in acute infections. Like you got a cut finger, you got some damage. Now, macrophages are uh, pretty longer term, they, they, lo they last longer. And so we look at these monocytes versus lymphocytes in the blood. Often it's like a long term chronic disease versus more acute kind of infection. But both of them work this kind of the same. They eat the bad guys. Neutrophils and macrophages are your two big phagocytes that will eat the bad guys. Oh, it's just what I said. Yeah. Chronic long term disease. Uh, these guys are much longer lasting. They eat hundreds of more bacteria. They can even eat uh, this, like some bad ones, uh, some bacteria have a more fatty coating on them, gram negative bacteria. These guys can eat some of the bad guys, the neutrophils. All right. So, looking at these slides, so if you guys have had lab yet, or you uh, will, we'll be looking at blood smears. And if you look at this, this is way the hell too many white blood cells. Like, this is crazy. All right, this is crazy. Even this is crazy. So you should know that in one milliliter of blood, there's about five million red blood cells. It's about like ten thousand white blood cells. Like that should be the norm. This is like crazy. So it happens if you guys are sick. So that's a lot of white blood cells, and they can tell with a differential count. Like they have a lot of acidophils, might be an allergy. They have a lot of neutrophils. Maybe you just had a recent infection. 
a lot of uh, monocytes, maybe they have a long term kind of disease. And if you have way too many like this, I would think, talk about leukemia, talk about some blood cancers, you're making way too many white blood cells because that's way too many. And once you're making so many of these, your blood doesn't function normally. Like you're going to be tired. Um, these things are going to be, uh, they're not going to be normal. So they're not actually going to be able to fight infections. And they have a lot of them. So, yep. So, leukemia, many different types, like your stem cells are making way too many white blood cells and they're often misshapen and useless. You have tons of them. Both that little I'm having a little special. Ooh, you guys ready? There's no points. This, this gets your adrenaline going. Right? Get out your paper. I should get pop for you. That's so fun. All right. Let's take a look. Yeah. So there's just some, I'll just throw up here. Just to get you guys some uh, practice. So, first of all, those are all red blood cells everywhere. Tons of red blood cells, right? But then you see the white blood cells are purple and they've been stained. With that horrible purple stain. And, uh, and I'll just point out, like if you guys saw this one, you just think, I think you should. Uh, this one is classic. You guys hear what that is? The confident? Now I have to put the pressure on, right? This is classic. You can't get it wrong, you're an idiot. It's a monocyte. You guys need to say monocyte, right? Big. Like that. Okay. Okay, you don't know, say it. Don't think your mind you're thinking. Okay, yeah. Ooh. Now you better know because I just talked about it. Is this the same picture just Yeah, I just want to do this. Oh, Monosyl is for you. Some of you saw some weird ones like kissing each other, but um, it's just this one. See, this is not, you shouldn't go to the doctor. It's just like keep your head on the side. Yeah, this one's pretty pretty big, but it's still going to be in there. Oh, it's going to be a big monocyte, root nucleus, but it's a monocyte. These are two neutrophils. That, that little pause is for you guys. Oh, yeah. Pause there. No. This one's actually how big it is. Oh. Oh. And then this one? This bright red. It's cinnamon. Oh, what's this right here? That's a little platelet. The red blood cells, a little platelet. All right, nice. All right. Good. Just a little bit of practice. You guys have to identify these for the practical part. All right. All right. I do want to. Oh, clock right there. Oh. All right. So let's, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit more. So today we're going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about coagulation of blood clots and then the blood types. There's some big things that are in my head I got to give to you guys today. So first of all, blood cells in the blood, white blood cells, don't do much. They, get, they leave and go into your tissues. And the capillaries, we'll see, are very leaky. They can easily get through. There's a lot of little, like, little, little uh, soot that you get. And there's a term I think I asked on the test. This diapedesis is when uh, a blood cell, white blood cell leaves circulation and goes into your tissues. Circle out of here, guys. And guess what? Histamine, histamine is going to make it easier for them to leave because it expands the walls and it makes it leakier. So histamine is going to bring more white blood cells to this tissue in question. Whereas the normal tissue is less leaky, they don't leave as easily. We'll also see on the surface of these cells that line the capillaries, it's going to send out signals, these little sticky protuberances that will stop the neutrophils and then they want to leave there. So if this, wherever the infection is, the white blood cells tend to go there and leave and go to fight the infection. Oh, beautiful, yeah. So you get this splinter, it's going to introduce bacteria. 
And then uh, the tissue damage and the bacteria release chemicals. They're going to cause the blood vessels to expand, become leaky, and attract really the, the neutrophils that you can get there by the millions, and they can go out with the cavalry and start fighting the infection. And any basophils in the area, they'll release their histamine and heparin to help this, this reaction go on. You see the neutrophils, they do their best. They're going to go, they're going to eat, they're going to eat. Then the debris becomes that pus. When they, they, they die, and then the dissolved uh, invader plus the dissolved tissue, they turn into this pus. All right, so I want you guys to know in terms of numbers that white blood cells are between five and 10,000 per, uh, per million. Red blood cells are 5 million. So I want you to know those numbers. And of course, if they take a, they do a blood sample and they do it, they run it on you, they do lab work, they want to look at what's your white blood cell count. Look at your red blood cell count. And if you have just very few white blood cells, if they're just seeing a couple thousand instead of 10,000, it's leukopenia. Leukopenia is going to be like not that many. Leukocytosis means you have too many cytos in the cell. We'll see with, with clotting and platelets, you have it can be a thrombopenia, a thrombocytosis. This is leuco means white blood cells. So leukopenia means you don't have enough white blood cells. Leukocytosis, you have too many. Just some terms. And of course, this can mean uh, there's different infections, things that cause you to have a few. Well, you can see like each ACE is going to be the, um, the virus attacks helper T cells. So it actually kills some of the white blood cells. We have two of those. Too many, you have a few infection. Yeah, good exercise. Exercise too hard, you're getting a lot of white blood cells too. So, yes, it's all that. Yeah. And to be specific, like leukopenia, leukocytosis is just do you have too many or too few? A differential white blood cell count will tell you if you have too many monocytes or too many eosinophils or not enough basophils. So, this is going to get you, it's going to give you percentages. And so, you look at what's normal. If you guys are way off from normal, that'll give the medical people a clue to what's wrong with you. So it's just another clue, information about what's wrong with you. Just broadly, do you have, what's your white blood cell count? Is it normal range or not? If you have leukemia or mono, you have way too many white blood cells, right? Some other things, some other viral diseases, you have way too few, you can't find infection very well. And then differential will give you even more information. Like, okay, what's going on? You know, if you have too many, too many of one. And I honestly won't ask you specifically, like, uh, you know, what disease is caused to you. I guess, leukocytosis, I already told you uh, that leukemia, you'll have too many, a mono to get a mono. Just give you an idea. You know, eosinophils, look, you got tapeworm, some kind of parasite. Yeah, neutrophils, I mean, some kind of bacterial infection, some kind of cod, anything like that will cause tons of disease. All right, I'm going to introduce you to platelets for a break. Throw up platelets. So platelets are also called thrombocytes. So thrombus is a clot. So platelets are tiny fragments of cells. They have no nucleus, and they're filled with chemicals for blood clots. All right, so they're very necessary. How many? You have hundreds of thousands. They're tiny, right? But they have hundreds of thousands of human blood. Remember, like ten thousand white blood cells, five million red. We're talking. 140,000 And again, they don't have a nucleus, and they just they just kind of pinch off these big uh, stem cells, and they just release into the bloodstream. They can move like like an amoeba. They can they can just kind of slide around, but mainly they're just sacks filled with chemicals. They're just waiting to clot. They're waiting to help plug a cut in the vessels. So thrombocytes means that means clot cells. Platelets are thrombocytes. Yeah, uh, guess what? The, instead of uh, erythropoietin to make more red blood cells, it's thrombopoietin. So thrombopoietin is the hormone that has you make more platelets. So if you guys have low platelet counts, um, you're not going to clot up. You can bleed too easily, and they can give you artificial thrombopoietin, and it's going to make your body make more platelets.
Well, platelets, they come from these huge stem cells called megakaryocytes. You have a picture of them. So see these big cells? This is bone marrow. And these cells are all the stem cells. These big ones are these uh, megakaryocytes, these big nuclear cells. And uh, they are going to have little extensions, little arms that go into the bloodstream. And then platelets will pinch off the ends and they'll go into the bloodstream. You always make your platelets in your bone marrow. And they just take a ride in your blood until you get some kind of cut underneath it. Last about 10 days. This is a big red carrier side of the platelet kind of pinching off. You know the platelet, it's like a, a sphere, like a it's like a um, flying saucer, and it's filled with those granules that are filled with chemicals for blood clotting. In a real life, a blood smear, so it's these little things. You can see the size of them. So they're tiny, and they're filled with chemicals. They last about 10 days. You know, it's like yeah, so your blood, I mean, the amazing thing about this whole clot, this, this whole idea, is that you guys have miles of blood vessels and capillaries. And if there is a leak, there's a cut, these guys will plug the cut. They'll make this sticky, like a rope, like net, and they'll, they'll still plug it. Imagine you're plumbing at home today, your car, it plugs up the leaks. It doesn't, right? It just leaks. This plugs it up. Now, if you cut a big arm, a femoral artery, it ain't gonna help. You're gonna, you're gonna die or die. But any kind of these small things, you get bruises, things like that, because uh, you have this self uh, sealing plumbing system, your, your blood vessels. It's so cool. And then the main thing is the Chitelian is clotting. It's, it's amazing because you're alive, because anything that goes wrong slightly, your blood will turn into like cottage cheese. Like it can clot so easily. So you don't want to clot when you don't want to clot. It has to move. But man, it's on the edge here. And sometimes like that deep vein thrombosis, you're on an airplane too long, you're trying to move your legs, you know? If, if the blood is stagnant, those chemicals build up and you start making clot. So what I'm just telling you is that, man, you guys are on this teeter-totter where if you clot too much, you make clots and you get a stroke, things like that. But you don't clot enough, you're like a hemophiliac, you bleed too much. So it's just, you guys are just like ready to clot blood. You can put it on a glass slide and clots. It doesn't like your body because your, your body is constantly keeping it moving. It's like, slow down, we don't need clots. But just so you know, this clotting thing is delicate, complicated. All right, so plasma, how are we doing? Let's see, I guess I need a bit. Ah, well, I'll start this, okay. <laughs> Keep on teasing you guys. Let's do a plasma real quickly. So, first of all, if you're a poor graduate student, you can sell this. And uh, <laughs> just, I happen to know that. Um, and uh, you get some money for it because they use it for research. And uh, it's the watery part of your blood. So it makes up half your blood. Is this, is, and then plasma is like 92% of it. But the other good stuff it has protein in it. And of course, nutrients. It has all your hormones and vitamins are in there, you know, and gases. So this is the plasma. If you spin your blood, the blood cells go to the bottom. And the top is all the fluid, kind of yellowish fluid. Yeah, 55%, a little more than half of your volume. Depends how hydrated you are. And it's filled with uh, protein. So proteins, these blood proteins are wicked important. That's, that's why you get plasma, because they want these blood proteins. Some of them for clotting, and then uh, some of these are for your antibodies. And some of these are just in the blood to help make it more osmotically dependent so that the water stays in the blood vessels, it doesn't make this swell up. But there's whole books on it, of course. <laughs> Look at all the blood proteins, but number one, they're made in your liver. Your liver is a big factory that makes all these blood proteins. They travel in your blood and they do things. So I tell you this will take a break. So albumins make up most of it. They're small little proteins. And this is the story. You make albumins, they don't do anything. But you need them there in order for the blood to have lots of dissolved substances in it so that osmosis is going to cause the water to be sucked back into the blood. Let me tell you this. Your blood pressure is going to tend to push the water out of those leaky catheters. And if there wasn't stuff dissolved in your blood, the water would stay there. Because it's filled with all these proteins, the sugar or anything, those proteins, this water gets sucked back into the bloodstream. That's the only purpose, the most common blood protein I do, is to make that osmotic pressure so that the water comes back. 
So what would be the consequence if you guys didn't have enough protein in your diet? You're starving. What would be one symptom you'd see in that patient? Well, they can't make albumin. What do you think? Oh yeah, I have that. Yeah, it's tongue out. But more generally, it's going to make you have edema. Fluid is going to like make you swell up because that water leaves the bloodstream; it doesn't come back. Yeah. All right, so that's the purposes of albumin. You make them, and uh, they just course in your blood, and they are keeping osmosis so that the water is sucked back to the blood doesn't stay in the tissue to make you all swollen. All right, globulins, there's alpha, beta, gamma globulins. Uh, you just need to know gamma globulins are your antibodies. That's another word for antibodies or gamma globulins. And those are made by a certain kind of lymphocyte called the B cell. And then alpha and beta, all I want you to know, those two are just going to help transport cells. So some things like your lipids, they're, they're not soluble in water, so they need something to transport them. From my earlier lecture, you know, like thyroid hormone or estrogen, progesterone, cortisol, those are steroid hormones. They can't just travel in the bloodstream because plasma is water. So they have these uh, uh, proteins that uh, transport them. All right, so albumin for osmosis, globulins, gamma globulins for antibodies, the other two are for tra helping transport. Then fibrinogen is the biggest protein, and that's for clotting. It's going to make fibers. The fibrinogen, like the genesis, making of uh, fibers. And yeah, as you mentioned, this this uh, this conundrum when you see people uh, starving, you'll see uh, this descended belly, and, and what this is is it's fluid because. Uh, and in many cases, they may have plenty of calories because, uh, can I talk about pause? I think I'll talk about that later. Um, it's often it's thought to be the, the second child. Once the, the so a mom has a baby, right? And feeds it milk and then has another baby. That kid's kicked off the milk, has to eat gruel pretty much. Milk had protein. Now, once it's kicked off and the new baby suckling, that kid starts to show protein deficiency. Because they're fed plenty of rice and uh, other starchy things, but not a lot of protein, like fish and meat. That's a thing for granted. But, you know, you don't have much protein, you get the calories, but you don't get enough protein, and then you can't make the albumins, you can't make the plasma proteins. So you don't clot very well, and you show this edema, the swelling, particularly fluid will leave the capillaries in the abdominal cavity, and you see this. And it's just water. And, and also, of course, protein starvation in the diet causes mental issues because you need protein to build protein. You need a protein in your diet. All right. All right, I got to take a break. You guys have been very patient. All right. So you can talk among yourselves. Uh, 11.44, four minutes break.
Are you guys confused by anything that I have a question? Okay. Red box, red box, yes. I have a question. I did. I hear this kind of stupid, but I'm in the south. 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 I'm your blood pressure, we do blood pressure next to the system, but the, the deal is the more fluid you have in your body, uh, the more pressure there is. Or your blood pressure is higher, but your heart, um, yeah, it's just it's just a matter of physics. So if you guys are dehydrated, you have a weak pulse, you're gonna have a low blood pressure, but the more the more fluid you have, the more higher blood pressure is going to be. Blood pressure is also how hard your heart's pumping, right? You know, how fast uh, that's gonna make your blood pressure go up. But fluid is just a basic. The more fluid you have in the system, the higher pressure. So one way of dealing with high blood pressure is water flow, diuretic. You can pee more water, and so you have to lower your blood pressure. Yes. You would have you would have more plasma. Yes, more plasma because it's more water in you. Yeah, definitely. Right. So your hematic rate would be lower. Now that's going to be easier. So the higher hematic rate means you have thick blood, like lots of red blood cells. So if you dehydrate it, you have a high hematic rate because most of plasma, 92% is water. If you have less water, you're going to have proportionally more red blood cells. If you're anemic, you don't have very much red blood cells. You could be like a fire, you can have something destroying your blood cells, you could be bleeding, something like that. Good, thank you. Yeah, I'll have questions for you on red blood cells and the five kinds of white blood cells and talk about platelets, monocytes. Now, gases, real quick, we're finishing up plasma, and then it'll be coagulation and that sort of thing. Well, of course, in your blood, you carry these dissolved gases. So, the most important is oxygen and carbon dioxide, which we'll talk a lot about in the respiratory system, which we'll get to soon. Uh, what else we got? Then we got some other ones. Um, nitrogen is the most common gas in this room, is nitrogen. So, you have dissolved nitrogen in your blood, too. But we should ignore it because it doesn't do anything. Um, and of course, you know, flowing through it is going to be everything you absorb from your diet. So sugars will be, uh, will be, you know, a lot of this stuff. Well, what do you absorb? Sugars like complex sugars are going to be polysaccharides, monosaccharides. Yes, so simple sugars are going to be found in your blood, um, like glucose, and then uh, uh, all your hormones that run around. Uh, and then importantly, lipids. And again, you guys, as you get older, you know, and maybe even younger, they look a lot at your cholesterol levels, right? So you can see there's all kinds of lipids. In digestion, we'll talk about this from HDL, all the other types of lipids. But uh, yeah, and lipids in your bloodstream, they can't just be naked, you know, like globs of fat. They're, they're coated by proteins they can dissolve because lipids are hydrophobic and they don't dissolve in water. They don't be Carried around by these things. Cool. And then uh, just real quickly with the gases, the nitrogen, again, yeah, uh, I don't have too much of this, you can just more. But um, the main the problem with it, with your blood is that nitrogen normally just is dissolved in it, it just doesn't do anything. But if you're if you are taking in compressed gas and deep levels, 
the nitrogen gets more and more energy and gets pushed into your bloodstream to dissolve. And if you come up too quickly, the nitrogen will start bubbling out under your skin, bubbling out of your brain, and you can get dead. So, and also when you're deep, over 100 feet deep, um, I didn't do this, but some others when we did advanced classes, go down there and you start getting drunk, right? And you start like, talking to fish, picking up your mask, doing dumb things. And so, um, and so often they give you a scuba diving tanks that are not without that, that nitrogen. Another gas is very expensive. The nitrogen at high levels causes issues. But normally, you guys breathe nitrogen in and out, wouldn't be anything. But if you concentrate in your blood by having compressed air, it can be helpful. And of course, the biggest thing is that air expands with less pressure. So if you take a breath of depth and come up, your lungs will expand and blow up. You know, if you breathe out. There's a few dangers. It's actually very safe <laughs> if you're breathing, stuck here, or doing scuba, and uh, not real deep. It's very, very safe. If you're going to go deep. These things are really have to be you know, computer together. Really pay attention. All right. Now, one other thing, when they do a blood panel, they look at other nitrogenous substances. Uh, bun, blood, urea, nitrogen. So, uh, nitrogen will be in, uh, of course, amino acids, normal. Like that. But things that we're talking about here, like urea and uh, uric acid, are breakdown products that normally your kidneys get rid of. So nitrogenous compounds like ammonia and stuff, you don't want that. You want to get rid of it. Your kidneys get rid of it. So when you have elevated fun, uh, uh, you have too much urea and waste products that you think like in your blood, you look to the kidneys. And the kidneys are probably failing. They're supposed to get rid of that stuff. So just want to let you know other nitrogenous substances that are normally filtered out by your kidneys. Those are high levels in your blood, it means your kidneys are not doing their job. And electrolytes, of course, uh, in your blood. I talked, you have uh, magnesium and calcium. And the biggest ones are sodium and chloride. Those are the most, you have salt you know, in your blood. And uh, but phosphates and sulfates, these things all need to be just properly the amount in your blood. You guys can function normal. And uh, your kidneys will regulate how much you have in these things. Uh, yeah. And if you work out, if you sweat, you're going to lose electrolytes and you can All right, let's talk about clotting. And this is really complex. I remember studying it in pharmacy school. Lindy, I'm looking at it. And uh, damn, I didn't learn all those complexities, but there's uh, all these factors and chemical reactions that occur. So hemostasis, stasis means static stopping. This is blood stopping. So that's what hemostasis is. And uh, how blood coagulates is uh, it's fascinating. And as I kind of alluded to, it's a dangerous proposition in your body, man. If something's out of whack, you clot too much or too little, and both are deadly. So you need to only clot when you need to So what does your body do if a small vessel is cut? Three things. One is that the blood vessel has a muscle on it. It's going to spasm. It's going to try to just shut down by squeezing. And so on a blood vessel, it can squeeze closed. I mean, and that gives it time to heal so you don't lose a lot of blood. All right. And then that cut is going to be plugged up quickly with platelets. So platelets are going to make this sticky mess. And it's going to actually, chemicals given off attract more platelets. And it's going to make this plug that will plug the blood when leaving. It's the blood's under pressure. You're just going to keep bleeding unless you stop it. So first thing is spasm the vessel. Second, let's plug it up. And then blood coagulation is the chemical. When you take uh, proteins from the blood that normally dissolve, you make, uh, you make this sticky mess that's going to go and, and uh, help that platelet plug. It's going to uh, stop the bleeding temporarily. And at the end of this, you got to get rid of that clot, and your vessel starts. There's factors that make it rebuild, so you're good as new. Like it puts a quick little plug on it, and then it like borders it up and puts the bricks on there. And then it then it's when it's done its job, you can get rid of the clot. And it's just smooth. So it's pretty cool. Yes, and so phlebotomists have told me sometimes you know a vessel will hide on you if you, if you stick it, it'll kind of contract. So if there's pain. Pain chemicals that blood vessel will contract, make it more difficult to get blood from it. 
And uh, yeah, serotonin, right? Yeah. Is uh, released in the sweet muscle. Yeah. What's your first name? Artery can spasm or prevent massive blood loss. This doesn't work on the big carotid artery or femoral artery. I mean, it, it, it tries to work, but it's not going to stop. The small arteries are a little bit All right, then. Normally, the blood is just exposed to this smooth endothelial lining. We'll talk about the inside of blood vessels. It's smooth. It actually releases anticoagulants slowly. So it keeps the blood moving. But if there is damage to this blood vessel, then you have exposed collagen. The cell has been uh, burst open and is exposed crap. And then all of a sudden, this blood's like, whoa, that's not a smooth lining. Something's going on. And then it's going to cause these platelets to release chemicals and start making that platelet. So that's what you look at. Is damaged blood vessels are going to expose the uh, the underside, you know, the, the the collagen and the the fibers, and that's going to cause these cells, which normally would just zoom on by, to stop. You realize there's a breach. So here's this exposed connective tissue, and the platelets will recognize that, and will kind of like move a little bit. They can like kind of move by and move up, but become spiky. So they kind of stick to each other and they'll continue to actually attract other platelets and they'll stick and they'll make them plug. The platelets will plug it up. Remember, they only last about how long? 10 days? They're just zooming in the bloodstream until they may or may not be called upon to plug your vessel. All right, so blood coagulation. Why it coagulates? So, um, and again, this can be a little confusing, but the deal is if you take blood and you just put it on a surface, it turns into clumpy, it turns clumpy. Right? Now, the coagulation happens in your body to help, clotting is going to help uh, block off any leaks. So let me tell you in the medical world, the big problem is your blood's clotting too much. If you've got atrial fibrillation or something, you make clots, and clots can go up and stick in your, your brain to cause a stroke or pulmonary embolism. So clots are a big, huge problem. Medicine. That's why people have blood thinners. Like that. So it's like, well, you know that, but they're also lifesavers because clots will help to prevent leakage. Now, the clot can form extrinsically or intrinsically, which means what causes the clot to first start forming? Extrinsically means it's in contact with foreign substance, like a breach, like a rip in the vessel. That's going to be that's going to cause chemicals in the in the, in the, the damaged tissue are going to cause this. Intrinsically means the clot forms from chemicals within the blood. So if blood contacts a foreign substance, there, it happens from the blood and begins this in the inside chemicals. This is what happens from the outside. Just bear with me. All right, it's just a review. Again, the blood uh, vessel is going to spasm to try to, to close off the, uh, the leak. Then you're going to plug formed by platelets near each other. Then the coagulation is going to begin, and uh, you're going to have start making these uh, sticky fibers. So that fibrinogen that was in there, that was in that one of those proteins, you're going to turn to fiber. These fibers, the sticky, like a uh, net that's going to like stick over the over the. Uh, the yep. Yeah. So the main thing, Rich, I'm going to show you this complicated reaction and tell you what you need to know. But eventually, you're going to have fibrinogen. Is one of those proteins I talked about in the blood, it's going to be converted to fibrin. So fibrinogen is dissolved in the plasma. Let's see it. Fibrin is when you take those pieces and put them together, it makes this net, this sticky string. Net. So fibrinogen is dissolved. Fibrin is going to be come precipitated out. It's going to be this net that you see right there. And that's awesome. It'll stick blood cells, platelets. It'll really close off that. Open. Let's see what I got. Let's see. Yep. So what I'm showing you here is here's damaged. And the damage, the chemicals we released that caused the platelets to really get excited. Like, oh my God, we're being called up. This is us. There's a damaged vessel. We need to start getting to work. And they will become spiky. They will release chemicals. They'll attract other platelets. And they're going to make this plug. They're going to do their best. They're going to throw themselves on that hole. And they're just going to the plug back. Then uh, there's really a lot of a lot of uh, chemicals that are going to cause this cascade of event. Chemical reactions are going to make a, a clot as well. Um, right down in your notes or circle, in order for clotting to happen, 
You need vitamin K. We'll talk about that at the end of the semester, vitamin K, vitamin K clotting, I know it's going on. And then calcium. It turns out with this coagulation um, reaction, at one point you need calcium, a couple points, and you need vitamin K. So if you're deficient in either of those, you don't clot right. You bleed, you have bruising too easily. And the big important reaction here again, fibrinogen to fibrin, and that's going to make these fibers that you see. So it actually causes this, the enzyme that causes this reaction is thrombin. So you'll hear that too. The prothrombin turns into thrombin, and then thrombin is going to turn fibrinogen to fibrin, which makes the fibrin. And again, just, I don't want to get into the weeds too much, but uh, extrinsically is started by uh, chemicals caused by damaged tissue is going to start the clotting process. So external to the blood, it's going to, it's going to cause that. And clotting is one of those rare positive feedbacks by childbirth. Normally everything is negative feedback, right? The room gets too hot, you turn on the heat, right? You have too much blood sugar, you, you take away the blood sugar. In childbirth, it's like contractions are strong. Let's make them stronger, you know? And in clotting, it's going to build, build, build. It's going to cause the more clotting, the more clotting factors are out there, the more clots. It's going to reach a point where you clot itself. And an intrinsic, um, I won't, I mean, like an application factor, but um, triggers within it. So if you take blood and just put it out on a glass slide, it will clot on its own from factors within. But here it is, here it is. The point is, whether it's intrinsic or extrinsic, just the beginning, and how does the clot start? But they all come together at this point for the same thing. And just like extrinsically, intrinsically is how clotting starts. Is it because of damaged tissue or is it just within the blood factors cause it to start clotting? But then when clotting begins, it very quickly comes out of the same process. And I'm not going to ask you, I put a big X over all this, but if you guys get into this, or whatever you happen to be studying, you will learn that we have all these clotting factors. And all these Roman numerals that they were discovered. You can see vitamin K and calcium is in there too, right? I see calcium a couple places. Um, but all these things are necessary. And uh, once you get to factor 10, it's, it's already come from both of these. And then again, ramen is going to make fibrinogen into fibrin. It's going to make the fibrin. I can skip over factor 7, factor 10. These are all things important to get. And just one thing you can take away from this is how easy things can go wrong. Like if you have any kind of mutation in any one of these 10 different factors, you're not going to clot right. It's going to bleed too much. You're going to be bruised easy, right? So you can see how hemophilia, you know, this inability to clot can be formed by all kinds of mutations because there's all this complex process. Any one of these can screw up. You can screw up the whole of the cascade of events. And in the hospital, they measure clotting time. I mean, the old fashioned way, they would cut you and see how long in the blood drift, you know, it seems kind of out there. But now they, get, they do these PTT and PT tests where they test clotting time. That's how I'm thinking about your blood work. What's the clotting time? If it's too much, too long, it means you're not clotting properly. Maybe you don't have enough platelets. If it's too fast, it means you're, you have an issue of that. Too. All right, so that's what happens when you clot. The blood turns like gooey and thick. That's blood clotting. And you gotta stop that, man. That cannot happen in a nice, healthy body. You cannot clot your blood. You need to be flowing smoothly, like this river. And uh, this river is a very good, that's my metaphor, my analogy, whatever, is that as long as you, these, these chemicals can build up and start the blood clotting, but as long as your blood is flowing, it keeps the chemicals diluted. But in places like the back of your knee and your pelvis, if the blood is kept stagnant, it will clot. Or in your heart, the areas where it's stagnant, the blood will clog. Those clots will be thrown and stuff will be clogged up anyway, right? So a key to this, and that's why sometimes you put heat on an injury, you'll keep the blood flowing faster. But you want to dilute the pain chemicals and dilute the clotting chemicals. So dilution is important. If blood is ever stagnant, it starts to clot because those chemicals build up to a threshold. But as long as the blood's moving, they're just dilute. But all of your blood cells secrete antithrombin. All of your blood lining, the cells that line your blood vessels, they're secreting anticoagulant to stop it. What can I say? Yes. So why are these corrections stops? Oh, definitely. Yeah. 
Um, what were they doing here? They uh they want to prevent uh, uh they want to keep the blood from your external like veins to keep the blood from the blood from the blood from the blood from the I assume when you're immobile like that, especially after surgery, you're worried about blood clots. And I think it's the immobility because I think just moving around without like trying to airplane you want to get up, I think they have to move yourself. Yeah, I'm not sure why I don't know why. I think all the details are there. All right, well, blood clots, once you have them, you need to get rid of them. Um, we'll talk about strokes in uh, MOI. Let me say a clot is a thrombus. So thrombus is a clot. And uh, that clot needs to be broken down. And if it's a big clot, oh, man, it's, I mean, you need to like, go in surgically to get rid of it. Um, there's clot busting drugs they'll put in that they'll break down smaller clots. Um, but clots are an issue because they're uh, coagulated blood. They can jam up in any artery that's like critical to your lung, to your brain. And then uh, we have chemicals that make the, the vessel regenerate, right? So blood, blood clot forms. Then once you're done with it, it's gonna like it's gonna like squeeze together and uh, hopefully be dissolved. All right. So a thrombus is a clot. Now that clot can break apart, pieces can break apart, and then it can move in your bloodstream. It's called an embolus. Now, an embolus is any foreign substance that's that travels in your blood. I mean, like visible. So it could be a it's usually a thrombus, it's a piece of clot, but it can be an air embolus. It's an air that can be a syringe, or it can be fat. So a blob of fat can put loose, um, or it can be if you have artificial sclerosis, part of the arteries can be a bit of fat, of calcified fat, and anything that's that breaks off and moves. And of course, the big problem is that this moving embolus is going to could jam up anyway. So whatever gets to a small vessel, it can clog it up. That's in your brain to stroke. That's what happens in your heart attack. You have a the most common get a clot that's going to block an artery that goes to a part of your heart, or a pulmonary embolus, really deadly. If a clot goes into pulmonary arteries in your lungs, it's deadly, right? So an embolus is a moving clot. But they can also be air fat and voice, and the thrombus is a clot. So that's why I mentioned we really worry about clots in the medical world. So it's your heart, your head, and your lungs, so clotting can, uh, can clog up that artery to prevent your blood from flowing. And here's after sclerosis. Normally, this is a nice, young, healthy artery, smooth lining. But when you have cholesterol and it calcifies and it fills the inside of your blood vessel, well, number one, the blood vessel gets narrower, so it clogs more likely to get jammed up there. And number two, that rough surface of the part of the arteries is going to cause coagulation. You know, instead of being a smooth surface, if you guys, and I never do cadavers, you look at an old person, you look at a coronary artery, if they crunch, they just fill with this plaque. And that plaque is going to cause turbulence, and it's going to cause more, um, more clots. Clots are going to form up. Atherosclerosis means hardening your arteries. Square is hard. All right, so if you guys take an airplane ride, a long one, or you're sitting for long periods of time, they're really worried about DVT. And deep vein thrombosis is clots forming, usually in the veins behind your knee or in your, in your pelvis, where blood can pool up. And that's the issue. Remember, blood stops. Those chemicals build up and clots form. And uh, your book has a little vignette of this guy who he didn't feel right, he ignored it, and he was dead like two days later. So this clot can form and then it can break off and then lodge in your, in your lung, in your brain. So, um, right. so deep vein thrombosis is clots that form, particularly if you're not moving for long periods of time. So imagine that's what the compression of God's are. So how do you keep you from clotting and maybe clots? Well, I mentioned one thing is just dilution. As long as your blood is flowing, it's, things aren't going to build up. And uh, we have, of course, um, chemicals. For people that tend to clot, we can give you it's called uh, warfarin or coumadin. Uh, 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 heparin is another. It depends on if it's short term or long term in the hospital. Doesn't matter. All these things work. Um, coumadin is a vitamin K. Like a vitamin K you need for clotting. Um, and heparin works a different different way. It just goes into that clotting cascade, 
and it screws up something so that you don't clot as much. So, uh, blood thinners, your grandpas, many of your grandmas will be on blood thinners. Um, you have an artificial heart valve, and it happens to be a metal type of maybe blood thinners the rest of your life because that tends to make blood clot. And you wear maybe maybe you wear some kind of a identifier when you're taking it because you bleed really easily. If you take blood thinners, it's going to make you bleed easily. It's preventing that on stroke, but you bleed easily. All right, so it's a, one or the other. Of course, hemophilia is, uh, you guys have heard of it. It's famous in the, the royal family in Britain. It's uh, hereditary and it was passed down a lot of inbreeding back then. Um, but men get it more often because it's, uh, I believe, an excellent trait. And um, yeah, so it's pretty rare as you can see. 400 babies a year in the US. Uh, yeah, as you can see, it's carried on the chromosome. So women are often the carriers, but you have to have a male that has hemophilia mating with a carrier of one. That's kind of rare, of course, it's already rare. So it's almost all males, but it's a clotting disorder where you bruise really easily. The point is dangerous because a simple cut draws you bleed out. So people that are even feel like kids, parents are real concerned. You know, they, they, they don't roughhouse too much because uh, again, bruises happen very easily. These tissue, these little bruises everywhere because you just don't pop. But you can. Uh, there's different kinds that they, they have uh, therapies. All right. So blood clotting again. I showed you like the hairy big. Uh, Frontal reaction, that'd be not simplified. So you know it's complicated, but hopefully I broke it down to what you need to know. Thrombin's gonna make fibrinogen the fibrin, and those fibers are gonna be sticky, and they're gonna everything's gonna stick to them and they're gonna make this clot. And again, clots are an issue because they turn to emboli to travel in the body. Right, let's talk blood types. So back in the day, back in the 1600s, they started blood transfusions, like from sheep. They would take blood and give it to a person. It didn't work great, you know, but sometimes the alternative was just as bad. And then they started human transfusions. And uh, the amazing thing was they would give someone someone else's blood, and sometimes they would get better, Eureka. But other times that person all of a sudden would have this look of panic or this pain, and then they would die of excruciating death. So take this pill, you can either get better or die of excruciating death. And then in 1910, they figured out the blood type. Oh, you need to match the right kind of blood. So for you know, the eighteen hundreds, they did blood transfusions, but it was they didn't know about blood types. So now we know it's got a match right. We know a lot about this. And honestly, there's like thirty kinds of blood types, like all kinds of markers on blood. But the AB is the most important. AB and the RH are the most important in terms of uh, that pitch. You can get away with the others, but really, you know, you have that blood type. Yeah. Oh my God, look at that. Bring that little sheep butter. Hey, should be familiar with some of you. Uh, we're looking at, uh, we can take um, blood, we can put it on these cards, and uh, if there's no, this is no reaction, blood's going to agglutinate. It's called agglutinating or clotting. It's going to turn, it's going to stick to each other because in here there's antibodies against the RH pack. And the antibodies, if you give it some RH, you're going to cause it to stick together in these big clumps. Reaction. No reaction here. This is type O blood, O positive. So again, maybe for some of you, but this one coagulates to type A, this one coagulates to type B, they both coagulate to type AB, neither coagulate to type O, and then the last one tells you the RH positive or negative. So the last one is positive or negative. The first two tell you if you're A, B, AB, or O. So genetics wise, it's called codominance. A and B are kind of both be shown. What type is this? That would be A B positive. B negative. How are we doing? This is helpful, right? <laughs> All right. So the deal is, you guys have on your blood cells. You have either A's, you have antigen. An antigen is a, a marker on your cells. All your blood cells, even other cells have like A and B markers, but you got an A marker on type A blood. I don't have an A marker. I got a B marker. Some of you, very few of you, have both A and B, and most of you have type O, you have A or B marker. These are chemicals that come off your blood cells that you recognize. 
Now guess what? You make antibodies for everything you don't have. So I'm type B blood. So early on in my childhood, like in months, um, I was exposed to some B and I make anti-B antibodies. No, anti-A antibodies, not type B. I make anti-A antibodies. I don't care because I'm type B, but I make anti-A antibodies. But they're always in my blood. So if someone gave me type A blood, I would attack the antibody to attack. Those of you that are type O blood have both anti-A and anti-B antibodies. If you're type O blood, most of you, type A blood, you're going to attack it. Type B blood, you're going to attack it. Type AB, you're going to attack it. But type O? It doesn't have any love. So that's kind of the deal. The antigens are what you have. You have either A, you got B, you got both, or you got none. Okay. And so these are antigens on your blood cells, and you attack whatever is not you because you make antibodies for whatever you don't have. It happens early in your life, you make antibodies. All right. So antigens are the chemicals that produce a reaction on the surface of your cell, and antibodies are made by your lymphocytes. And they're going to uh, attack foreign blood. All right. So here's type A blood. You've got A antigens on it, and you make anti B antibodies. It don't affect you because you don't have any Bs. You're just A's. But if someone gives you B blood, you're right, you're after it, and you destroy it. And here's type AB blood. You've got A's and B's. You better not make any antibodies because that is dumb. You get back in your own blood. So you don't have any antibodies. And then type O blood, you make anti A and anti B. You don't have either. So you always make antibodies for what you don't have. So that is the key to decide, determining who can give blood to who. All right? So if you're type O, you got nothing on your surface. You can give it to anybody. Yeah. Because there's nothing to be like, offended by. <laughs> there's nothing on it. If you're type A B blood, you can't give it to type A because you got B's on it, you can pack it. You can't give it type B because you got A's on it, won't pack it. Huh. You can't give it to O because you won't everything won't pack it. So AB blood, um, O is the universal uh, donor. AB can receive it, you can't give it to it. Now, what's happening? What causes this agglutination? These antibodies will cause them to clump together in these big groups. This is what kills you if you have a transfusion reaction, is that these clumps will clog up your kidneys. So, Blood clumps up in these big clumps. It's going to go through your body. It's going to especially, the kidneys try to filter it. So that's why we type your blood. Uh, indeed, it works really well. Easy to do. Surprisingly, very few of you know your blood type. I didn't either. They just don't tell you that much. It's funny, in Japan and other places, they think blood type has a lot to do with personality, who you're like, who you want to have as a mate or whatever. And again, hope this is helpful. I don't think I need to go over too much. Um, but it's just one more chart that I found kind of helpful. And um, oh, in terms of, uh, yeah, this is kind of complex, but uh, if you're O negative, you got nothing. You don't have your H factor, you don't have A's or B's yet. Uh, let's see. So we're looking at, uh, I believe this is, um, it depends on what race you are, where we're talking about in the world. So you can see RH positive is going to be like 80% of you. Um, yep, and RH negative down here. And then you can see type O is very, very common in type O. So I remember in lab, mostly O's and A's, a few less B's. No AB's that got out of uh, Oh yeah, and so people think that uh, that it affects well, let's stay with horoscopes. No offense, anyone, but it's just made up stuff. So, yeah. and of course, it's genetic, um, and so uh, uh, type O is recessive, A and B are co-dominant, and so you can figure out from your parents what your chances of being uh, different types are, of course. And you can have a type A to be a parent, you can be type O, you can do that, you can kind of square. Yep. So here's a type A and a type B, mom and dad, and uh, they can have kids with any of these. It just depends on what alleles they get, right? We can be O for both of them, we can be type O. We can be 
you can be Abram's dad and then you can mom type of thing. But if you both type O, you should be O, right? All right, this RH is one more thing. So the A and the B are two antigens. RH is first written by the rhesus monkey, so that's why it's called RH. And uh, it's just one more factor. And if you guys are RH negative, that means you don't have the RH factor. Very positive, you have it. And guess what? If you're RH negative, that means you don't have the RH factor, you could make anti RH antibodies. And so if someone gives you RH positive blood, you will attach it. So as a donor, RH negative is more useful because it doesn't have any RH markers on it. Right? RH positive has those markers on it. If you have the RH negative, so if I'm B negative, if someone gives me B positive blood, I should attack it because it's got the RH factor and I don't. The other way works fine. If I get negative to positive, it's not a problem. Um, and then, of course, the cool story with this is that um, realize that a fetus, a baby, is a parasite inside its mom. It is not mom or dad, it's this other thing because they have a different blood type. So if a mother has a different blood type than their, their baby, it's okay because the blood doesn't mix. And the antibodies for A and B don't cross the placenta. So you could be a mom with type A blood and have a type B baby. There's no, like, you don't attack the baby's blood because the placenta keeps the antibodies apart. The blood never mixes. And you have this kid. Now, the RH factor is interesting. If you're an RH negative mom and you have a baby with an RH positive dad, and the baby's RH positive, your RH negative, it's actually still cool because you're still separated. But during childbirth, the placenta breaks, there's blood that goes across. Some of that blood from the fetus in the placenta gets in the mom's bloodstream, and then she will make anti RH antibodies. Yeah, she'll make them. Sometimes it's not the second birth, sometimes the third birth. Every time, every birth is greater percentage. And so that's cool. Mom's still fine. She just has anti RH antibodies. But the second baby, if it's also RH positive, again, rare, RH positive again, then those antibodies for RH can cross the placenta and will attack the fetal blood. And the fetus has all kinds of issues. So it's the second birth in an RH negative mom from an RH positive dad that becomes a problem. But this is not something you guys to stay up worrying about because every birth in American hospitals, they check your RH level and they give you drugs if this is the case. It'll be very good. Uh, whatever type I type you are, you can take a look. You can see the A allele, the A, uh, where we have it in the world. Kind of cool. Hey, I'm type B. Mostly Asian over here, but rare over here. And then looking to type O and type A are the most common in Caucasians. You can see, you look at uh, Hispanics and, and Asians, you have different variables here. So it's genetic based on that. Oh, I love this is RH factor. So look at different countries. I think it's so cool. So RH negative, you see RH positive is much more common. Good stuff. All right. All right, you guys. Stay safe. Hey, see ya.